Have you ever heard someone say, less is more? When I was a kid, I was the oldest in our family. And I remember you know, when it came time to splitting things up, because I was the oldest, I would always take the biggest portion for myself. And then they would ever get, you know, they would ever get whatever they, what I gave them. And this caused a tremendous amount of resentment with my younger siblings because they could see that I was being unfair, unjust. Um, but of course, to me, it wasn't unfair and unjust at all because I figured I was the oldest. I deserved it. I was owed the bigger portion because that's the way it was supposed to be. They didn't see it that way at all. They just saw that I was taking the biggest part for myself and giving them what was left over. And they were right. But I always looked at it like, well, you're lucky I'm giving you anything at all. But they always looked at it like you're being unjust and unfair. So they thought they were owed. I thought I was owed. Everybody th thinks they're owed on this planet. And it causes a lot of trouble. But less isn't really more. And how you know that is if I give you less, it's less. But what I want to talk about is more is less. Because less really is more, I want to talk about more being less. Now, I know that's backwards, but from the way we usually look at it. But sometimes we need to look at things in different ways to get a different perspective on it. To come under fewer laws, we deliberately place ourselves under more laws. If you want to be able to play a musical instrument with ease, with grace, with facility, then you have to put yourself under a lot of laws in order to get to that place where you can play without all those laws. It's like Rachel plays the violin. When Rachel first started to play the violin, it was a very small violin. She was a very small girl. She had little fingers and a little bow. And you remember this. And then they tie little ribbons on the fingerboard so that she would know where C was and where this was and where that was. And she would just go to that. And that was how little colored ribbons. You remember that? And she, so she was under a lot of laws. She had a lot of things to help her because she wanted to be under fewer laws. She wanted to be able to play without the ribbon. How many years has she been playing violin now? Nine years. So after nine years, she doesn't have the ribbons anymore, does she? The ribbons are long gone. In fact, she thinks about the ribbons and kind of smiles. Oh, yeah, I remember the ribbons. That was a long time ago. But now it's all second nature. Her finger just goes right to where she doesn't have to look to see where it belongs. It just goes there. Now she's working on entirely different things, techniques, you know, bowing, fingering. Um, you know, she's just working on different things. She's working on you know, tone, and she's working on things that are more advanced. So she put herself under a lot of laws in the beginning so that she could free herself from some of those laws. But now she's putting herself under more laws so that she can free herself from those laws. And so this work is like that. We deliberately put ourselves under more laws. A runner deliberately puts himself under more laws in training so that he can finally, after his training, get out there and do without all of the laws. Right? If you ever watch they train how they train horses, they'll put them in these little rigs and they'll limit their movement and and they put them under all these laws. But and it's for one reason, one reason only, so that they can ha be under less, fewer laws. And so our training as children, we are put under a lot of laws by our parents and by our teachers, so that we there can come a time when we are under fewer laws, when we can actually begin to think for ourselves and do for ourselves. That's the theory behind education, probably not the education that we get in this country, but it used to be the theory behind education, even in this country. Better influences don't come from life. This is a very difficult one for a lot of people. They think that life is going to influence them in a way that will make them better. What they don't understand, what we don't understand, is that life influences us for its own purposes. Life has in mind for us one thing. Life looks at us as this object. And work, this work looks, as, looks at us as a different kind of thing. Life looks at us as like cattle. We're here for a specific purpose. Life doesn't look at roses and daisies and pansies. Life looks at plants that have a purpose, photosynthesis, and cooling and cleansing the environment and all of the things that plants do. So life looks at, doesn't look at individual pansies. We do that, maybe. If we develop consciousness, we do that. If we don't, we just see them as plants, trees, plants, flowers, depending on our state of consciousness, depending on our level of being. Better influences don't come from life. 
but they come from the conscious circle of humanity, which is outside of life. Conscious circle of humanity is what we call those people who began to awaken more than we are awake. Those people, though they could be in life, walking around, those people are not like us. Those people see more, are aware of more, and have powers that we do not have. Well, like what? So they can fly? No. <laughs> powers like the ability to think. What do you mean I can think? No, you can't. And the fact that you said, what do you mean I can think, is proof that you can't, because that's a reaction. Because if you really could think, you wouldn't need to react, would you? You wouldn't need to do anything. You would realize, well, he's right, I, I can't think. I can think better than I could, but I can't think as well as I'd like to be able to think. And if you're not there, then you're not conscious. You're not becoming self-conscious. And this is about self-consciousness. It's about, you know, we know the, the states of consciousness, sleep on the bed and then waking sleep when we're walking around when the moving center is active, but we're still basically in the same, pretty much the same state except with the moving center. We, we're not asleep on the bed anymore. Now we're asleep walking through life. Hit the freeways out there and you'll see lots of people driving, sound asleep. Cell phones, eye makeup, reading, changing their pants, looking under the seat, driving 65, 70 miles an hour down the freeway while they're looking under the seat for a CD. It's like, yeah, that's, that's wide awake. You, there's, there's no question about it. That's not, a, that's not awake. That's not responsible. That's not awake. People who are awake don't do that. People who are awake pull over. But that's such a bother. It's only going to take me a couple of seconds to get the CD. It's only going to take me a couple of seconds to make the phone call. I can see that and do this. It's multitasking. I can do that. The insurance companies, of course, who have to pay for our multitasking, have all these studies that every time we multitask while we're driving, we double our, our chances to be in an accident. So if you're putting on your makeup, talking on your cell phone and driving, you have tripled your chance. Unless, of course, they have some other statistic that I don't know about that is more than tripling it, exponentially increasing the risk. If a man knows about this, this work, and doesn't make effort to remember himself, this work can have no action on him. See, if you know about this, if you've heard about this, you know about this, and you don't do anything about it, you don't actually try to remember yourself, then this work can't do anything to you. It's impotent. It's useless. It's just worthless. Just because you can read a book about something, just because you can hear somebody say something doesn't mean you can do it. A friend of Connie's one time, a lady, a couple of ladies bought motorcycles and they went and took this motorcycle safety course, graduated from the motorcycle safety course with flying colors. And the woman got on her motorcycle one day, hit the gas and I guess she wasn't quite ready for it and kind of threw her back and went to threw her back. Her hand pulled all the way back on the throttle, which hit the gas even more and she drove into a wall through the house, she rode, basically went through her house and racked herself up and destroyed the motorcycle and gave up her career riding motorcycles right then. My point is, just because she did the class doesn't mean she knew how to ride a motorcycle. And that's the way it is. And that's even more so with just reading a book or hearing a lecture. She actually did a hands-on ride around with being instructed and practicing doing it, but it wasn't enough practice. They didn't handle that particular situation where she gave the gas, it startled her, and she fell back. And when she fell back, she pulled back on the throttle more and went flying through the house. How many times if you're out on a bicycle and you hit the front brake too hard and not the back brake hard enough and you go over the handlebars? It happens. Well, well, who does it happen to? It happens to people who are not very well experienced on panic stops on a bicycle. That's who it happens to. But people who go out into a parking lot and practice panic stops until they get it just right, that doesn't happen to them anymore. Why? Because they learn it, they get it into their mechanism, they get it into the body, they get it in a second nature, and they get it handled. That's why police are trained in how to drive their cars. Now, that doesn't mean that they stay out of accidents. It means that if they did the training and if they stayed awake, that their chances of staying out of accidents are better. If we know about this work, and we don't make an effort to remember ourselves, the work can have no action on us. Knowing about it isn't enough. Unfortunately, we think that knowing about something is all that's needed because then we can parrot talk. We can repeat it. We can go tell other people and other people will go, oh, he knows so much. Or you can read a lot of books that I haven't read and you can know more than I know. 
then of course I can't be your teacher anymore because you know more than I know. Now you may not be able to do any of it, but you can talk it and you know it and you've read the books and you may even have certificates from seminars and classes that said so-and-so has successfully completed this. But unless you can be it, do it on a daily basis, it's meaningless outside of your imagination. So the work can have no action on you. We must have an internal connection rather than relying on external connections. This work is about making an internal connection, which is the hardest connection to make. The external connections are easy. You come here, you sit down, you have an external connection. I say words, you listen to some of them, and some of them actually trigger something in you. So you may think, oh, I understand that, and you may actually understand it for the moment. And then you don't understand why when you leave here or tomorrow, I understood that yesterday, why don't I understand it today? Because our levels of being change. We don't, we're not always in the same level of being, it's fluctuating. So what we understand today, we may not understand tomorrow or an hour from now or a half an hour from now because we run out of fuel. Like Jennifer's running out of fuel right now. Her eyes are floating there at half mass. She's hardly able to keep herself here. It's like, well, it's been a long time. You know, he's been talking for an hour. He did those other three or four podcasts already. Now he's working on this one. So it's like, oh, it's quick. Somebody throw some cold water on me. That was it. That was the cold water. Now you have to do the rest yourself. It's up to you now. So this internal connection is more difficult. What we think about secretly is far more important than what we show the world or what we think about externally. What, what is it we think about secretly? <laughs> well, we're not going to tell that, are we? No, we're not going to tell that because that's secret. And we know that if we tell that, then everybody will know our secrets and then we'll be undone. They'll think badly of us. So we keep it all secret. But you see, the only thing that really matters is what we are doing internally, our secret thoughts. Jesus put it another way. A man speaks out of the fullness of his heart. Well, a man doesn't always speak out of the fullness of his heart, does he? No, because sometimes he can cleverly lie, but in, indeed he is speaking out of the fullness of his heart because his heart is full of lies then. Deception, secrets. There are two ways to look at everything, at least two ways. There are actually thousands of ways to look at everything. But we're not quite ready to look at that. But what we think about secretly is far more important than what we, what we show the world. Only the deep, deepest part of us can change. Unless those ideas or these ideas reach that part of us, these work ideas reach that part of us, that deepest part of us, then the work remains external to us. The work remains external to us if all you do is hear it and you don't apply it. Then it remains external to you. And if it remains external to you, then you have to keep on hearing new, 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 more, 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 more. You've got to keep reading more books. You've got to keep going to more lectures. You've got to keep going to more seminars. You've got to keep going to more movements classes. You've got to keep going to more of this, more of that. But you see, if you let the work become in, internal to you, actually get inside of you and begin to work, all those things are no longer important in the same way that they were important. They serve their purpose. They are seed delivery systems. They are delivered the seed into the soil. Once the seed is in the soil, the seed takes over. The work from out here is a very external thing. As I plant seeds in you, some of it falls on good soil. And then a work starts in you, and it's your work. It's no longer the work. It's your work. It's internal to you, and it begins to change you inside, and it changes you according to what you need to have changed. This is when the work really starts to work for people. Unfortunately, most people don't get there. Most people keep it external to themselves. Most people are not willing to have the secret part of them changed. Having knowledge of something isn't the same as acknowledging it. The former resides in memory. Knowledge resides in memory. Do you know how faulty your memory is? If you don't, then start to observe yourself. Last night I talked about something that happened to me when I was a child. I was, I was kneeling in a wagon, and uh, our, little, our neighbor, who was our playmate, I was kneeling in the wagon facing backwards, facing the other way. He grabbed the handle and pulled the wagon. Well, when you pull something like that, I didn't have it, because uh, I didn't know it was happening, because it was behind my back. I just went straight down like this, and my chin hit the cement. And cut it open, split my chin open, because I never had a chance to put my hands out to break the fall. I just split my chin open. And I remember going to the hospital. I remember putting my hand up to my chin and feeling this burning sensation. 
and pulling my hand away, and it was just full of blood and blood everywhere. And I freaked out and went running home, crying. I was probably five, six, and uh, my parents decided that it, uh, I needed to go to the hospital, and they were right. The doctor was a, a foreign woman. This was back in the 50s, so a woman doctor was unusual in this country, but because she was probably from Russia. I think my mother later told me she was Russian. She's probably from Russia. It wasn't so uncommon because they have a different way of, they had a different way of doing things. Um, she stitched me up. I remember getting three stitches. I remember them telling me I was getting three stitches. I don't actually remember them poking me six times, but I remember being told I got three stitches. And I remember also my mother told me that had it gone just a little bit further, I would have died. It would have severed something that was vital and I would have died. I don't know whether that meant I would bleed to death or what. But anyway, to a five-year-old, this was a very important thing. I almost died. And I was praised for being so courageous, for being such a courageous boy, for not crying and for letting her stitch me up and for being brave and not carrying on in the, in, you know, in the hospital and all that stuff. And so I, I realized that I got it into my head that to be hurt was not a bad thing if you were courageous, if you didn't behave like a maniac, if you behaved calmly and you took the pain and, and you measured it and you just moved through it the best you could, that you were a better person. And so I noticed that a pattern in my life developed where I would get hurt a lot and then I would be a brave, courageous, wonderful person. So how I got to be a good person was to go out and slaughter myself get in accidents and break things and, you know, fracture things and cut things and get stitches. And then I was a really great guy. And I thought, oh my God, my mother had no idea what she was doing. No idea whatsoever. And this pattern that, that, that then grew out of that has been a lifelong pattern. And I think, oh my God, we're doing that all the time. This is the, this is the acquired part of life. It's terrifying when you think about it. So having the knowledge of something it's not the same as acknowledging it. How much of my memory of that incident, I had to actually look at it. All these things that I'd been told, that I believed, they became part of my memory. So I, I, I thought that I remembered that the woman was a Russian, that it was a woman doctor, she was a Russian, that I got three stitches. When the truth was, I had no way of knowing whether or not she was a Russian. I did have a way of knowing she was a woman. She did appear to be a woman. I had no way of knowing how many stitches I got, really, because I couldn't remember that. But because I'd been told I got three, I just made that part of my memory. Because I was told that she was a Russian, I made that part of my memory. Because I was told that the, the, the kid that pulled the handle of the wagon, see, I was born and raised Catholic. He was Jewish, and the Jews killed Jesus, so they were bad, and so that's why he did that. You know, these are the things that I was told. This is all part of my memory. Now I look back at that and I go, wait a second, but most of that is false. The only thing I know for sure is I was kneeling in this wagon and I smashed my chin when the wagon disappeared out from under me. I don't really know who pulled the wagon. Somebody else told me who did that because I didn't see that. So I really don't know if it was really Larry. It could have been my brother and then just blamed it on Larry. I have no idea. I will never know, but I accepted it as truth and it was a lie or not a lie doesn't really matter, but I accepted as truth something that I didn't know. And I made that truth, and I had no way of verifying it. One resides in memory, the other one is real. The real experience was the real experience. I remember the searing pain. It was, it was like hot. And I remember the blood when I looked at my hand. And I remember thinking, uh-oh, I'm hurt, <laughs> i got to get home. And I remember going to the hospital, and going to the hospital was a big deal in my family. You didn't go to the hospital unless you really needed a doctor. In our family, you went to the bathroom with my father. He fixed you up. It wasn't like, you know, we weren't like, uh, we didn't run to the hospital all the time. He was the medic in the family. He fixed you up. If it was really bad, you went to dad. If it was just minor stuff, you went to mom. She took care of it. But if it was really bad, you went to dad. Then you knew you were in trouble. If you, if you were going to die, you were going to the hospital. And that's how it worked. So much for memory. What resides in memory is faulty. You can starve to death entertaining the memory of a great meal. And that's my point in this whole thing. What is in memory isn't going to feed you internally. And we need to make this internal connection and be fed internally. For this work to work, we must value it. And that means we need to feel the ideas emotionally. You can only feel ideas emotionally inside of you, internally. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you'll have to think. 
about some idea that you have an emotional feeling about. I don't mean a negative emotion. Oh, that's hard to do now. <laughs> you took away all my, you took away my entire palette and asked me to paint a painting now. You take away my entire palette of colors. Because all of our colors that we have to paint with are all negative emotion. We have so few experiences of real emotion that it leaves our palette very limited. The emotions, the affections, are what make connections. From behind the facade springs everything essential. This facade of false personality that we present to the world, from behind it, anything essential comes. So when Jesus said a man speaks out of the fullness of his heart, what he was saying was what is essential comes from behind the facade, from within a man. It's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out of the man. Because what comes out of him comes out of his essential part. That was essentially what he was saying. The facade is what life has built. Better influences don't come from life, but they come from outside of life. And we don't know what outside of life really means. Jesus enigmatically said, Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. As this work enters more deeply, it sets up a continual quiet conflict in us. We're no longer at peace with ourselves as we are. This is a very unpleasant thing at first, to not have peace with yourself as you are, but then to find still some peace of mind in that is a challenge. It's, it's doable, and you have to do it, because if you don't do it, then you're going to be constantly edgy, agitated, and you're not going to be able to work because you'll be negative. You've got to be able to work and not be negative, and there is a way to do that. You can have a deep internal peace of mind and still not be at peace with yourself. In other words, I know that there are things about me that need to change. I have a deep abiding peace that I am doing the things that I need to do to change them, even though that change is going to take a lot longer than I suspected it might. And there's the peace. It's the peace that passes understanding. It's the peace that goes deeper. It's the peace that abides even when there's a storm. And there is a storm. There's always a storm in the false personality. It's always wrangling over something. It's what it does. Either that or it's asleep. We begin to see life and ourselves in the light of the work. And when we do, we are no longer at peace with ourselves as we are. We become aware something is going on deeply inside of us. Something that wasn't there before we met this work. When I say met this work, I mean before it became internal for us. I don't mean met it externally. I mean when we meet it internally. When it really, when an idea really gets into us when it finds good soil and really gets into us and starts to grow, then we have met the work. And then we realize something is at work in us. And we don't understand what it is and we don't know what it's doing, but we know that it's there. And we take a certain comfort in that, but we're also a little afraid because we don't know what it's going to do. And that can be a little scary for us. Now I notice that some of you are getting this. Some of you have this experience already. And so you're getting this like, yeah, I knew that one. And some of you are still looking at me like I have two heads. And that's okay. It takes time. Then we realize it's useless to try to persuade ourselves of the truth of this work. You remember the first time you ever read the Sermon on the Mount? I, re I remember the first time I ever read it. Because I was like 19 or 20. And I thought, wow, that's, that's good stuff. All you have to do is just do this. And I couldn't do it. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't do it. <laughs> I thought, well, it must be for somebody else then. He didn't know what he was talking about or... Oh, I'm not, I'm not the right kind of person. I guess I'm just too bad or something. Couldn't do it. I think a lot of people give up because they can't do it. And, they, and there's nobody, the rest of it on how to do it was all lost. All we're left with, if you want to be this and you want to be that, then do this and do that. Well, great. But how do you do this and do that? It took me years to figure out. It took me years to find something where there was a system where you could actually could actually show me how to do this and do that. Show me the mechanics of doing this and doing that. Showing me what effort was necessary right now where I am, not where I would, well, if I was Jesus, I could just do that. Yeah. Like there was this uh, uh, guy named Biff Rose in, in Madison, Wisconsin. He was an entertainer, and he had this song he used to sing, and, I, and, it was, and, and some of the lyrics were, I wouldn't mind hanging on a cross if I knew what Jesus knew. Well, that may seem sacrilegious to some people, but it doesn't necessarily to me, because I wouldn't mind hanging on a cross if I knew what Jesus knew, except that I'd really want to know it and be it. 
not just have the knowledge of it. See, because I can read the Sermon on the Mount and have the knowledge of it. That doesn't mean I can do it. Blessed are the peacemakers. Yeah, that's great. Blessed are the pure in heart. Oh, that, what does that mean? I'm pure in heart. No, I'm not. All I have to do is look at my heart and I can see I'm not pure in heart. What does that mean? That I have a bad heart? No, it's just mixed. It's just dirty. It fell in the dirt. You know, it's not black. It just fell in the dirt. Well, how did it fall in the dirt? Well, look around. It didn't even actually fall in the dirt. It was just blowing around. I got in a dirt storm one day and there was all this dirt all over it. Did you ever, did you ever leave anything, leave a piece of fresh meat or something out on the counter? What gets on it? It's like, ah, you know, we'll leave it outside. It's even worse. And that's what, that's what our hearts are like. Our, the essential part of us, it's got to be protected. It's got to be coated so that it doesn't get dirty like that from life. And so, we grow this false personality around ourselves, around the essential part of ourselves to protect our hearts, to protect ourselves until they can be strong enough to be able to deal with what's out there in life on this planet that we're on, under this system that we're under, 48 orders of laws. It's a necessary thing. It's a life-saving thing. It's not a bad thing, but it's useless to try and persuade ourselves of the truth of the work. I don't care how many times you read the Sermon on the Mount or the Ten Commandments. It's useless to try and persuade yourself that you're doing it. It's useless to try and persuade yourself that that's the right way if you can't do it. You have got to apply it. You've got to find a way to actually apply it to make it real for you because persuasion doesn't work. We acknowledge our perception of the truth through self-application. I can persuade you that treating everyone with goodwill is a good idea. But you can leave this room and not get down the street. Mm -hmm. And that can be out the window because it's in memory. But if you understand by application that goodwill is something that comes from within you and nourishes you, it's something that you give, but it also nourishes you because you have it inside of you. And it nourishes others. And it nourishes you while it's nourishing others. That giving it away actually increases it for you. If you understand that because you have applied that, it's a totally different story. You get down the street and you have an opportunity not to have goodwill. And because you have not persuaded yourself this is a good idea, but because you have it inside of you, you react differently. In other words, you don't react, you act instead. Self-application. Each idea begins to expand into larger meaning and we find ourselves resisting without wishing to resist. How many times do you find yourself resisting what I'm saying and you don't want to resist? You just dig your heels in. No, you're not taking this away from me too. <laughs> right. Uh, you're right. I'm not. I'm asking you to give it up. I'm asking you to sacrifice it. And I'm not even asking you to sacrifice it. I represent the work. I'm the advocate. I'm just the work's lawyer. <laughs> you know, that's probably... I'm, I'm, I'm the work's advocate. I advocate the work principles. I try to apply them in my own life. I advocate them to you. I ask you to try to apply them in your life. I encourage you. I hopefully inspire you to apply them in your life so that you can taste and see for yourself that it's good. So that you can see for yourself by application, self-application, rather than just allowing it to reside in your memory. So that you can plant it inside of yourself, make an internal connection, and find the truth of it yourself. It's much more powerful that way. And as we do that, the ideas begin to expand into larger meaning. And as we get into the larger meanings, we find that it means more of us has to change. More of our mechanical life has to change. And as we find more of our mechanical life has to change, we find that we automatically have more resistance to that because the machine resists change. We do not do what we know and as a rule, do not know what we do. We don't see who we are. We don't see what kind of people we are. And that's what that means. And because we don't see what kind of people we are, we don't see what we do. Through the heat and the pain, we begin to realize something new is acting in us without compulsion, without persuasion, and pretty silently, actually. This seed growing inside of you is really not compelling you to do anything. It's really not persuading you to do anything. It's really quietly growing. There's something happening inside of you if you have allowed this internal connection with the work, with some idea. Then it becomes necessary to pay attention to the work ideas and see new meanings in them. It has to become more inner and less outer all the time. You've got to make all of these ideas more internal. You've got to find more internal meaning and less external meaning. It's not about changing the world. It's about changing you. If anything happens out of that, great. If not, great. We begin to feel the need to remember ourselves. Thinking isn't enough and self-remembering isn't thinking. 
Self-remembering isn't thinking. What is it? Can't we just say it's not thinking? Why don't we just say that? Why don't we just say self-remembering is not thinking? Because if you're thinking that you're remembering yourself, you're not necessarily remembering yourself. Can you see? Thinking really can lead you astray. We have associative thinking. We have imaginary thinking. We have all this thinking, but it's not sure. Self-remembering, you're sure when you're remembering yourself. Really, when you really remember yourself. For example, let's say all of a sudden you find yourself in the middle of doing something and you remember yourself. Remember the prodigal son? He goes and spends all the money and he finally he's starving to death. So he goes and gets a job. And you know, he's a Jew, so being around pigs is like the lowest of the low because they're not allowed to even touch pigs, swine. So he gets a job feeding pigs. He's so hungry that it looks like a good idea to eat the slop that he's feeding to the pigs. He came to himself. What does that mean? He remembered himself. And he said, wait a second. Even my father's servants live better than this. I'm going to return to my father. And I'll just say, look, Dad, I screwed up big time. Everything I did was wrong. I am so sorry. I don't even deserve to be called your son. Just hire me as a servant. Let, just let me serve you. He remembered himself. It wasn't thinking, was it? You see the difference? That's what I'm talking about. Self-remembering isn't thinking. It's coming to yourself. It's remembering yourself. The real essential part of you. What you're really here for. What it's really about. That was good. I'll have to remember that. <laughs> we remember not to allow ourselves to become negative because it spoils everything. Just like a nasty mold. We had this... Uh, Patty made us some cornbread. and We had this cornbread... Connie kept hers in a plastic bag. Well, the plastic bag was sealed. And of course, that makes just a perfect, it's a Petri dish, a plastic Petri dish. Well, naturally, you seal a plastic bag with something moist. And of course, the weather got warmer, so it was humid. And, and it created this little environment for mold to grow. And, and I looked in there one day, and it was, it was all green and hairy. <laughs> I said, wow, look at all that mold. You know? And I opened it up and looked at it, and there was absolutely nothing that was salvageable. It was all covered with mold. And that's what it is like to get negative. Have you ever eaten moldy bread? You have never eaten moldy bread? You should go home and try it. Yeah, well, it, it stays with you. The taste stays with you. It stays in the back of your throat. It's, it's a good experience. It's a good experience. It stays in the back of your throat and it kind of gets up in your nasal passages a little bit. Some of you are grimacing like you've had that experience. It's not something that just comes up to the sides of your mouth or the front of your mouth. It goes back. It's deep. And it's, it's a profound experience eating moldy bread. And everybody ought to do it at least once. It's a good experience. So anyway, the point is, is that negative emotions are like that. We need to know what they are. If you don't know what they are, how will you know when you're negative? How will you know when they're in your throat and in your nostrils and in your stomach and in your whole being? How will you know when they're taking you over? You've got to know what they taste like, know what they smell like, know what they feel like. And the only way to do that is, is not to go get negative emotions. You've got a whole <laughs> truckload of them already. All you have to do is begin to observe them, begin to pay attention to them, begin to be mindful of them, begin to remember that you are not those emotions that you can separate yourself from them and you can look at them and see them as if they were interesting strangers. Then you can gain power over them. Negative emotions spoil everything, just like a nasty mold. You have to throw it all away. It's not like cheese. You get some mold on cheese, you just cut off the outer part. Then the, the rest of the cheese is fine. That's the whole idea. Don't think that I came to bring peace on earth. I, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Well, sword and knife something to divide. To divide what? Well, to divide the, the mold from the cheese. To divide the mold from the bread. You know, not everybody in the world has always been as wealthy and well-fed as we are. You know, there were times when people had to eat moldy bread and they were glad to get it. And you know, that sounds like something your father told you, right? The point is, a knife or a sword divides the mold from the bread, the mold from the cheese, the good from the bad. And we need that. We need that division in ourselves. And that's what the sword is for, so that there is no peace with us inside of ourselves. We are always seeing that there is something in us that needs to be corrected and something in us that is okay. 
And we need to be able to divide them and look at them both separately and then have them still be part of us and accept them as part of us. How did they discover penicillin? Well, it was mold. It was mold, which was this terrible thing that nobody wanted, but now it becomes this life-saving thing. And that is, if you can make that connection, that's what this is like. You know, the very thing that you reject, when you embrace it, you find that it has uses and it has benefits and it will help to make you whole. And that's what really what penicillin gives you the, your body the opportunity to do is to make itself whole again by helping your body to fight things that are in the body that are fighting the body. Or at least that was the initial wisdom of it in the beginning. If you have no room in yourself for this work, how can it influence you? You've got to make room in yourself. We become aware... We must isolate ourselves from life influences through non-identifying in order to create space inside of us to feel this work. You're not going to feel this work and have space inside of yourself for this work if you're running after life influences. It's just not going to happen. It's why kids don't usually do this work. They're still developing false personality. They're still developing personality. Un unfortunately, they're developing false personality. They're supposed to be developing personality. But it's impossible in this world to develop just personality. You're going to develop false personality in this world, which is the unpleasant part of personality that needs to be made passive. But the world is making it active because of the life influences of the world. It's just the way it is. So kids don't really appreciate this work much as a rule because they're still creating their personality. And that's right. That's what they should be doing. A division begins in us which we must nurture, allow, protect, and with which we must cooperate. We deliberately place ourselves under more laws so that we can free ourselves to live under fewer laws and better influences. Fewer laws means better influences. Better influences means better food, better energies, better nourishment, the essential part of us so that it can grow. As it grows and becomes stronger, it can become active. And the false personality, which is full of life influences, things that serve life's purpose, can be made passive. And as that is made passive, and the essential part of you is made active, the entire direction of your life changes. Everything in your life changes. Things that used to happen to you don't happen to you anymore. And if they do, they don't affect you in the same way. That's power. That's real power. That's real change. That's what this work offers, if you're willing to apply it.